This is a short video about monotone functions, and then in a future video I'll tell you about inverse functions too. But for the usual setup, say you've got some subset of the real numbers, and you've got a function whose domain is that subset A. So here's a bunch of definitions. We're going to say that the function f is increasing on its domain if whenever x1 and x2 are points in the domain, such that x1 is to the left of x2, uh, then f of x1 should be lower than or equal to uh, f of x2. And if I was to replace this less than or equal to by a strictly less than sign, and I would change the adjective increasing, I'd change it to strictly increasing. So I think I've got a picture for you here. Just what's an increasing function look like? I'm saying that as you move farther to the right, your graph should get taller. So the output should get bigger as your inputs move to the right. And again, in symbols, that is what this is trying to say here. As the outputs move to the right, I'm sorry, the inputs move to the right, the output should get taller. Uh, and so similarly, we'll say a function is decreasing on its domain. Whenever x1 is less than x2 implies f of x1 is um, greater than or equal to f of x2. And again, if I change this to not equal to, so strictly bigger than, then I'll say strictly decreasing instead of just decreasing. And so to give you a picture here, this looks like a picture of a strictly decreasing function, where as my move to the right with my x values, I see the y values get lower, right? And so again, in symbols, that's what this is trying to say. Okay, so those are increasing and decreasing functions. And remember, we had this term monotone for sequences. And I mean, we had these concepts increasing, decreasing for sequences too. Same idea though. So monotone is kind of this catch-all phrase that can mean either of the following. You've got a function that is increasing or strictly decreasing on its domain. And it could also talk about functions that are decreasing or strictly decreasing on its domain. So just to give you an example here, in both of my pictures, each of these are considered monotone functions. So one thing to be careful about, this monotone functions, we've been talking a lot about continuous functions. Maybe you think, hey, monotone functions, they're probably nice. If I'm always increasing or always decreasing, uh, should they be continuous? And the answer is no, not necessarily. So monotone functions need not be continuous. So just to give you an easy one, think about like a piecewise function. f of x is zero if x is negative, uh, and it's one if x is bigger than or equal to zero. That's definitely an increasing function but it's not continuous. So uh, it's increasing, right? So like, as I move to the right with my x values here, I get that all the y values are the same, which as far as increasing is concerned, right? This says it's okay if they're the same. I guess this equal to says that's okay. And then finally though, when I make that jump, once I get to over to zero here, you know, I see again, I make the jump and the y values get taller as I move to the right, and then they stay the same again. So technically, yes, this is increasing. It's not strictly increasing, but it's increasing. So of course, what am I trying to say? I'm trying to emphasize that this is a piecewise function that's monotone, but it's not continuous, right? Clearly it's not continuous when x is zero because of that big jump there. Okay, so something that will prove. So let's say i is an interval. So I'm not saying it's like gotta have brackets on the ends, just any interval. Maybe it's got a bracket on one end, a parenthesis on the other, who knows? Let's say you've got a function whose domain is i, and for now let's suppose that that function's increasing on a. There's a similar result that can be stated a little bit differently if you suppose decreasing. Let's let c be a point in i, and let's make sure c is not an endpoint of i, just so it makes sense to talk about points to the left of c and to the right of c that are still in the domain of this function. Then, the first thing I can say is that the uh, left-hand limit of my function, so as x approaches c from the left, that's what a little minus sign in the exponent means, it should be just the supremum of all the outputs of my functions where the input comes from i and uh, my input is to the left of c. And similarly, the limit, the right-hand limit, the limit as x approaches c from the right of my function should be the infimum of all the outputs where the inputs come from i, and again, the only inputs I care about are the one to the right of c. And I've got a picture for you to um, try to make you buy this. So what we're trying to say is, what should the limit from the left be for number one? Well, it should be this point right here, right? And so if you notice, right, that is, that would be whatever this number is, it would be the supremum of all these y values that are y values of points on the graph, such that I'm to the left of c though. Similarly, what's number two trying to say? It's trying to say that the the uh, right-hand limit is as I approach C this way, right? 
that's me looking at this piece of the graph and I see that right hand limit is this whatever this y value is here and that's the lowest point on that graph right that's the infimum of all the y values that are points on the graph as long as I'm to the right of C the whole time so again just looking at this piece here so hopefully it's not too hard to believe so how would you prove this so we'll just prove the first one that uh, the left hand limit is the supremum of the output whenever your inputs are to the left of C so let's look at that set. So the set of all outputs where the inputs are to the left of C. I claim that that's not empty. So why is that? Well, this is important. Why, this is why it's important that I chose C not to be an endpoint of that interval I. So if C is not an endpoint, you should be able to find an X in your interval that's a little bit to the left of C. And so uh, in that case, wait, did I say that right? Yeah, I think so then uh, f of x should be less than f of c. And so that shows me that uh, this x is within that set there. And uh, if I, what else can I say? This set, it should be bounded above by whatever the value f of c is. Uh, how come? Well, because my function is increasing. And uh, let's see, what else can I say? x is less than c. Yeah, okay, I don't know what I was thinking of. Yeah, those match. So uh, what can I say then? I've got a set of real numbers that's bounded above. Then I know that the real numbers have the supremum property. So therefore, the supremum of that set exists. And when I say this set, I'm saying this set here that's not empty. So this thing has a supremum. And so maybe for convenience, let's say the supremum of that set is just this real number L. And so what do we know then? So remember the supremum is a least upper bound. So that means if you took a little bit away, it's not an upper bound. So given some arbitrary positive number epsilon, if I took a little bit away from L, then that's not an upper bound for this set here. So what's set? For this set minus the supremum part. So L minus epsilon is not an upper bound for this set. And so what's that mean? Well, that means that you should be able to find a point that's in this set that's between um, L minus epsilon and L. So we'll call that point u sub epsilon. So there should be some, some number u sub epsilon in your interval uh, such that u epsilon is still to the left of c. And though, like I just said, um, the output of u epsilon should be strictly between L minus epsilon and L. So what we'll do now is let's let delta or delta sub epsilon, let's say that that is the value c minus u epsilon. So remember c is like the farthest right that I care about going right now. So it's c minus this new number uh, u sub epsilon. So what if you were to take a point in your interval i where y is to the left of c uh, such that um, maybe y is also um, within this new delta epsilon number of c. So in that case then, what do I know then? Well, I know that uh, C minus Y, that's gonna be even smaller than C minus U epsilon. How do I know that? Because that's what delta epsilon is. So all I'm doing is I'm kind of plugging in delta epsilon is C minus U epsilon. Plug that in here, you get this right here. Now what we'll do is we'll rearrange this inequality a little bit. So if you think about doing some algebra to this, I see that the C's would cancel if I subtract, and I would move the Y to the right and move U epsilon to the left. So I get that Y would be bigger than uh, U sub epsilon. So now let's think about this expression then with respect to these guys. So L minus epsilon, remember that's less than or equal to say F of U epsilon, but that's less than F of Y now. How do I know that? Because my function's increasing and Y is to the right of u epsilon. So that means that the output of f of y should be taller than the output f of u epsilon. But then that should still be less than L, right? Because L is the supremum of all outputs of my function where the output is, or I'm sorry, where the input y is to the left of c. So therefore, what do you get then? I get that f of y is between L minus epsilon and L, which says that f of y is within epsilon of L. And recall that that means that the limit as uh, x approaches c from the left is, uh, or x as y approaches c, sorry, from the left, is uh, equal to L. So that shows that the uh, left-hand limit is this number L in this case. And uh, 
notice in that what we just talked about, right? I didn't say anything about that magic word continuous anywhere in this result that we just looked at. But what if we threw that word in there? Then what do I know if the function f is supposed to be continuous, then I know that the left and the right hand limit have to be the same number. And in fact, it just has to be whatever f of c is, right? Remember, c is the point that I'm getting close to. And so what if I threw that extra in here? Oops, I don't want to go that far down. So the following are equivalent, saying that f is continuous at some number c that's in my interval. Again, assuming it's not an endpoint. That's equivalent to saying that, again, the left hand limit is the same as the right hand limit, which should just be the value of my function at c. And then finally, like in the above, that's the same thing as saying that the supremum of all the outputs when the inputs are to the left of c should be equal to the infimum of all the outputs when the input is to the right of c, which again, at the end of the day, boils down to should just be the output of the function at c. So again, continuity is kind of what you'd like to see in a function.